Hi, everyone. I'm Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yakker. My guest in today's show is Mark Dawidziak. He has authored or was the editor of over 20 books, is an internationally recognized Mark Twain scholar, and has spent over 40 years as a television, film, and theater critic at a number of newspapers. I'll be speaking with Mark about his book, A Mystery of Mysteries, The Death and Life of Edgar Allan Poe, Mark Dawidziak. Welcome to Paranormal Yacker. Hi, Stan. Thanks for having me. Most biographies are about the life and death of the subject being written about. Your biography, Mark, of Edgar Allan Poe does a complete 360-degree turnaround to that approach in that you have chosen to write about Poe's death and life instead of his life and death. What were the reasons for doing that? The title is very intentionally reversed from what you expect because I wanted people to expect the unexpected. This is not a traditional biography in a lot of ways, in a lot of senses. We've had a lot of traditional uh, biographies of Poe. We've had a lot of conventionally written A to Z biographies of Poe. I didn't think we needed another one. I thought Poe was an unconventional figure. He was an unconventional writer. And I thought an unconventional biography was the way to go. And the other reason was that with most biographies, you do start at the logical point, which is when somebody's born. You start when everything usually life starts with a birth. Yes, except that it always seems that any discussion of Edgar Allan Poe always seems to start with his death and then the mystery and the enduring mystery of how he died. With Poe, it always seems to start with a death in his stories and it always seems to start with a death when you're discussing his life. It's sort of the point of origin with him. The other reason I intentionally reversed it is because there is this mystery about how Poe died. The only thing we kind of really know for certain sure is that Poe stopped drawing breath on October 7th, 1849, and that the next day he was buried in a small Presbyterian cemetery in Baltimore, a dismal, windy, cold, wet, rainy day, attended by very few people, and that the next day he was buried again, because on October 9th, somebody he thought was a friend published a obituary in a New York newspaper, which depicted Poe as every awful, horrible, immoral thing that you could think of. What Poe did not know was that this guy was nursing grudges and did not wait until the body was cold yet. Right from the, we, we so Poe dies, he's buried, and then the next day he's buried again under this mountain of misinformation and myth. And the damage that that obituary did has not been unraveled to this day. He was still laboring under the misconceptions about Poe because of that. And then in the 1870s, they dug him up and they buried him again because they wanted to put a nice monument in this cemetery where he was originally buried that was too small for the monument. So they dug him up and they buried him again. Now, here's the thing. If you know anything about Edgar Allan Poe's stories, you know this. Nothing ever stays buried in an Edgar Allan Poe short story. This is true of Poe too. And this is another reason I reverse the title because Poe's going to escape the grave. Poe's going to escape all these burials and he's going to emerge from the grave as the best read, most recognized American author of all time. And there's not even a good close second choice. Everybody has read Edgar Allan Poe. Everybody will read ever Edgar Allan Poe because everybody gets him in the seventh grade. He's curriculum. He's our renewable energy source. And he is our most popular exported writer around the globe. Poe not only escapes the grave, he escapes triumphant. And that's why death and life, his afterlife, is just amazing. He's going to have the last laugh. He's going to outlive and outshine all of those writers who are supposed to outlive him. Uh, Poe's early years were quite sad, what with him being orphaned as a toddler. What mark do you know of his early years? Poe is born in Boston in 1809. He is the son of actors. His father was not a very good actor. And from his father, he inherited a certain sensitivity and probably a problem with alcohol. From his mother, however, who was a very gifted and talented young actress, leading actress of the American stage, he inherited his work ethic because she had memorized a staggering number of roles. You had to if you were going to work as an actor back then. You had to travel from city to city. And it's not like today where you set up your show and you do the same show for weeks, maybe months on end. Oh, no, no, no. The theater going audiences back then were not that large. So you wouldn't go into a city. You had to offer something new every single night or else you didn't work. They, they already saw the thing you did on Tuesday. What are you doing Wednesday night? Elizabeth Poe memorized a staggering number of roles. She was good at comedy, tragedy, 
Shakespeare, far, she could sing, she could dance. Poe inherits both versatility and creativity and a work ethic from his mother. That's three things I said both, but he inherits all three of those wonderful traits from his mother. He is not yet three when she dies of tuberculosis in Richmond, and he is taken in by a family, the Allens, a couple. John Allen is a merchant. While he does make sure that Poe is educated and well-fed and well-dressed, he also never lets Poe forget that he is a charity. Case. He never formally adopts Poe. That's where the middle name comes from, Edgar Allan Poe. It comes from John Allen. But John Allen always seems to almost resent the fact that this orphan is a dependent. The older Poe gets, the worse that relationship gets. And when John Allen dies, a very, very wealthy, one of the wealthiest men in, in Richmond, John Allen leaves money to illegitimate children. He leaves not a cent to Edgar Allan Poe. So Poe is condemned to an adult life of poverty. And he battles poverty for all of his adult life. It is one of the recurring, because he's the first American writer who tried to make a living solely as a writer and an editor. Most writers of the 1800s had day jobs. They, they worked at universities. They worked at local parishes. They had government jobs. Poe tries to do it just on his writing. That's hard because there are no copyright laws. He'd get paid a few dollars for a story or a poem, and then it would be pirated up and down the American coast. It would be reprinted, and he would get not a cent for any of that. Poe was very poorly recompensed for his writings during his lifetime, yet he really tried to make it on just his skill with putting nouns and verbs together. A very brave thing to try to do. He only lives to be 40. All of those adult years are marked with hunger, poverty, and uh, really struggling to try to make it. Edgar Allan Poe was best known for his poetry and short stories, especially his tales of mystery and the macabre. Did any supernatural events ever occur in his life that might explain his fascination with the macabre? No, but death certainly stalks him. The The, the recurring theme in Poe's life is the loss of, uh, of women, of mother, mother figures, women he loves. He loses a lot of people. For somebody who only lives to be 40, you see this and it's, there's no surprise that one of the recurring themes in Poe's stories and poems is the death of a young woman. One of the misconceptions about Poe is that he was a perpetually depressed, melancholy person. He, he was at times, and he was drawn to the death culture of the time. The, 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 this is the American period of what we was called the death culture, when all of a sudden the cemeteries became very ornate and the, 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 the funeral rites became very ornate. And there was a lot of death. A lot of children died young. There was a lot of diseases that could carry you off at any point, cholera, yellow fever, typhoid, tuberculosis, any of these things could carry you off at any point. Life expectancy was not long. There was a lot of death that people dealt with, and we created sort of a, a culture of death, and Poe was somewhat drawn to that. There was a part of Poe that was drawn to that. But Poe was also a very funny guy. He was a very witty guy, as most horror writers are, by the way. If you interview anybody like Stephen King, I had the pleasure of interviewing most of the great horror writers, Ray Bradbury, Robert Block. Richard Matheson, Stephen King, Anne Rice, and directors like Wes Craven, Mick Garris, and people like that. And they all have one thing in common. They all have great senses of humor. And when I mentioned this to Robert Block, who, the author of Psycho, Block said, well, of course, you have to have a sense of humor. If you do not have a sense of humor and you write horror, you'll go crazy because that's what keeps you grounded. That's what keeps you centered. Writing horror and the writing about the supernatural is cathartic. We work through our nightmares. We put our nightmares down on paper and then we give them to you. It's your problem now. We're done with them. That's something that bothered me because we don't think of Poe as having a sense of humor. We think of him as being a very sickly, sallow, hollow-eyed guy sitting in an attic with a raven perched on his shoulder and red-eyed black cat prowling among the cobwebs. And he's spinning out his tails with a quill pen, probably in a fever dream of drugs and alcohol. And none of that's true. Poe is a very careful artist, very careful craftsman. He crafted his work with extreme care. He's constantly revising his work. He was athletic. He was a good boxer. He won every jumping and leaping contest that there was. He walked with a very erect military gait. He had been in the army as a young man, and he never lost that sort of military stride. It's only in the last couple of years that he starts to fall apart, and he starts to look like the Edgar Allan Poe that we all think we know. And one of the reasons is because there are only about eight known photographs, daguerreotypes of Poe. They're all taken in the last, almost all of them, but one are taken in the last couple of years of his life. When he's starting to look bad, and something is obviously going wrong with him. And of 
course, in daguerreotypes, you were not encouraged to smile because it was hard to hold a smile for any length of time. You sat in a very uncomfortable chair. There was a brace at the back of your neck holding you in position. Nobody smiled in daguerreotypes back then. Poe's not the only one who looks dour and melancholy. Everybody does in photographs from that era. If Poe had lived into the next half of the 1800s, into the era of what was known as the Kodak, the candid camera, where anybody could take pictures of their relatives and their friends, we would have pictures of Poe having leaping contests in his front yard and splitting his pants and laughing himself silly over it. We would have pictures of him playing duets with his wife. We would have pictures of him laughing. If we had one picture of Poe laughing, how would it change our image of him? It's not that Poe wasn't that guy who was sort of drawn to the death culture. His hero was Lord Byron. He liked to, he had a very romantic figure himself. He liked to dress in black. He certainly liked to play up the reputation. Like when The Raven is published in 1845, he finally gets a little bit of fame. You said like he was best known for the, the, the short stories of the macabre and the mystery. The truth is in Poe's lifetime, that wasn't true. In Poe's lifetime, he was not best known as a short story writer, nor was he best known as a, even a poet. In America, Poe is best known as a critic. He was known as a very savage, exacting critic with extraordinarily high standards. He believed that American literature would never come into its own unless it was pushed to escape the bonds of Europe in general and England in particular. He was advocating for an American voice in literature. It made him a lot of enemies, but he was best known. He was so exacting as a critic, his nickname was the Tomahawk Man. In his lifetime, Poe is first known as a critic, secondarily as a poet, and third as a short story writer. Our century, our time has reversed that order. We know him first as a short story writer, then as a poet, and then if you know it at all, as a critic. It's one of the reasons I wrote the book is because there are so many misconceptions about Poe. There are so many myths. And one of the main ones was what I was talking about was in getting to know so many people who do horror in the supernatural, writers, directors, actors, I noticed that almost all of them did have wonderful senses of humor. And it almost became logical. Wait a minute. If Poe was so good at this, he must have had a good sense of humor. And guess what? He did. Most people don't know is Poe wrote as much humor as he did horror. We just don't read the humor anymore. We just don't uh, aren't aware of that. But easily, because Poe wrote a lot of hoaxes, satires, humorous pieces of different kinds. And even a lot of the horror stories are funny. The Cask of Amontillado is a very very funny story. It's grim as all get out. But, you know, it's basically the story of one man leading another to his death. The main character of Montresor, he has been insulted by the noble Fortunato. He is going to exact his revenge by luring Fortunato into the catacombs, the crypts of his house. Fortunato has this cough, and it's a cat and mouse game. Montresor's constantly saying, no, no, let's go back. Let's go back. Your health is precious. We must go back. And it's a cat and mouse game because he knows Fortunato isn't going to turn back. And he keeps he keeps giving him chances to escape his own death. But there's a moment where Fortunato has this coughing fit and he can't talk for a couple of minutes. And Montresor says again, come, we will go, we will go back. Your health is precious. You are a man of importance. For me, it is no matter, but you are a man who will be missed. And Fortunato says, enough, enough. It is a mere nothing. I shall not die of a cough. That's a laugh line. Poe has let you in on the joke at this point. And he even at that point gives Montresor the line of true, one word, true. You're not going to die of a cough. It's a richly funny moment in a very horrible story and a very grim revenge story. Poe's even funny in the horror stories. And you have to look and you have to notice. Yes, he did have a great sense of humor. He was very warm, engaging, great public speaker, was a very great demand on the platform, loved to perform The Raven. When The Raven became a hit, it. He'd make sure the lighting was all perfect and all the candles were in the right angle. And, and he had this, this wonderful voice, this wonderful Tidewater accent, and he would recite The Raven. And he embraced that, almost like the way Stephen King plays up the appeal as the horror writer. Poe did that. There are stories of when The Raven became successful. His nickname was The Raven Man for a little while. And there are stories of him going out on the streets of New York and the, the neighborhood kids would follow him at a distance and throw pebbles at his heels. And he would wait until they got just close enough and then he'd wheel around and he'd say nevermore and they'd go running off screaming and he loved it he just loved playing up to that there's a story of a, of a young woman and her father had brought this young woman to the, the cottage he was living in at the end and in what is now the Bronx near Fordham they went inside and there was a portrait of a woman in the parlor of this little cottage Poe could see the young woman looking at the portrait and he said to her no it is not the lost Lenore he knows what she's thinking any of us would have been thinking at the same 
same time. Poe also played up to it as well. When Poe's life has been written about, he is often not pictured in a favorable light. You, Mark, mentioned positive things about him, which you've mentioned before in our interview, such as him working as a literary critic, having a wonderful sense of humor. He's also involved in producing a large amount of work not in the horror field, such as science fiction. Could you expand on that? Vincent Price, who is a great interpreter of Edgar Allan Poe, Vincent Price once said, and he was not talking about Poe when he said this, but he said that the man who limits his interests limits his life. That is a great description of Poe. Poe was interested in everything. He's interested in science and geography and languages and rocks and flora, he, just everything. Poe seemed to have this acquisitive mind. He's always drawn to, I think one of the reasons he, he's drawn to the horror story and the mystery story is because they are two very distinct reflections of Poe's personality. The mystery story gives us the comfort of, of providing answers, being able to figure out a puzzle. And life is a mystery, isn't it? And Poe sort of said, well, I'm the guy who can figure out the mystery. I'm, I'm the smartest guy in the room. I can figure it out. The horror story on, is also a search for truth. And the horror stories tend to be about really big things, big themes. But the horror story also says, but you may not get an answer. You might arrive at the end of the journey, but you may not get the answer you're searching for. It's not guaranteed. Both of these were part of Poe's personality. There's a quest for truth. But Poe was interested in everything. He wrote an essay called Eureka, which many people think prefigures uh, modern physics. That's how in his mind worked. That's how incredibly his mind worked. He wrote pieces which were very influential on later science fiction writers. Uh, you don't want to overstate the case for Poe because there's a lot of people who want to say, you know, he invented the modern horror story or he invented the, the science fiction story. That's a very extreme claim. Certainly there are many, many writers in the 1800s who get a piece of the credit for that. The major one who precedes him is Mary Shelley, because Mary Shelley, Frankenstein is both science fiction and horror. Mary Shelley certainly is a is, is before him. But if you had a Mount Rushmore of horror writers from the 1800s, the, the ones who wrote the seminal works, certainly Mary Shelley, Poe, Robert Louis Stevenson, and Bram Stoker would probably be your Mount Rushmore of the people who brought horror into the modern age. But Poe was, you know, one of the scholars I interviewed said, everybody wants Edgar Allan Poe playing on their team. That was a great way to put it. You know, the mystery writers want Poe. They name their award. The mystery writers of America have the Edgar Award. The horror writers obviously acknowledge Poe as the, the headwaters for American horror, certainly. Critics should, because he was a very important and influential critic. He obviously wrote great essays. He also was a great, he did stories which are tinged with humor, and he did stories which are tinged with science fiction. Like I said, a very versatile writer. But I think one of the things you have to understand about not just Poe, but that that time in that century is we really didn't have writers who were specialists the way we have now. Branding, what's, what's the idea of, of branding is a very much a 20th century American conceit. The idea that you have to label something. Everything's got to have a label. You got to be able to almost be like a, sticking a bug on a board with a pin and putting a label underneath. This director is a, is a thriller director or this director is a horror director or this writer is a mystery writer. Or Writers of the 1800s would never have accepted did that. And they wouldn't have even known what you were talking about. Somebody like Poe would have said, well, I do enjoy writing a good, scary story, but I also write this, this, and this. You know, Robert Louis Stevenson would have said, yes, today I'm writing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but tomorrow I'm writing Treasure Island. And tomorrow, the next day I am writing A Child's Garden of Verses. And the next day I'm writing essays. If the best way to tell the story was to tell a spooky story, that's the way they would tell it. But they would have never considered that as the defining thing of their career. And I think it made them better at those things because they were interested. All those other things informed their horror fiction. If you're just interested in horror, if that's all you are, you're limiting. It's again, it's Vincent Price. You're limiting your life, but you're also limiting your own literature. The fact that Poe was interested in all these other things made him so much a better observer of life and therefore a much better observer of our fears and our insecurities and all of those things which go creak in the night. Poe was very attuned to those things. And one of the reasons he was attuned to those things is because he was interested in all those other things. And it made him so much better a horror writer because of that. If Poe could come back and see where his fame is today, he would probably be at the same time delighted and appalled. He would be delighted that he was so well known and that his fame had outlived and outshone all the people who were supposed to outlive him. I think that part of it would have just delighted him no end. But I think he also would have been a bit appalled that we have reduced him down to a small part of 
of what he wrote. I think he would have thought, well, yeah, but I look at everything else I wrote. <laughs> you know, well, why is it just those things? And the reason that those things are because, again, they are so incredibly resonant. His stories never go out of fashion. How could you go through a pandemic and not see that The Mask of the Red Death is more resonant today than it was a hundred years ago? You have a story about human vanity and Prince Prospero taking his courtiers and sealing themselves into a castellated abbey where there is food and there is wine and there is partying. It was folly to worry because within these walls are security and within these walls are food and wine and without is the Red Death and the Red Death will never get in here. You know how it's going to turn out. <laughs> you know how this story is going to go. The ending of the story is, I think, one of my famous favorite lines from Olaf Poe is at the end when the Red Death has made its presence known among the partiers and one by one they start to drop in their steps and Poe gives us that great line and now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death he had come like a thief in the night and if that doesn't put the hairs on the back of your neck up when you hear that I don't know what will in uh, researching Poe what sources did you go to in gathering the material used in the book and that's one of the things that uh, I did take away we talked before about how I took an unconventional approach to the biography. There were two major chances I took with this. One was a dual timeline where the chapters alternate between the last four months of Poe's life with these desperate last four months where clearly something is going wrong. We're examining the death process in these one chapters and then they alternate with chapters looking at different sections of his life. And then the two timelines meet at the end where I present my theory as to what killed Poe in the last chapter. The other chance I took was I did interviews. Now, in addition to doing my research, in addition to doing research with museums, different academic institutions and such, sort of the traditional way you would research a biography, I also did interviews. So how do you do interviews for somebody who died in 1849? There's nobody alive who knew Poe. There's nobody alive who knew anybody who knew Poe. So how do you do interviews? Well, I was a journalist for 43 years, and I knew that this book was not going to be the type of book an academic would write. I'm just not that type of writer. There's nothing wrong with that type of book, but I knew this was not going to be a scholarly, definitive, academic type biography. Oh, there are better people to write that kind of book. At least there better be better people to write that kind of book. I had to write the kind of biography and I couldn't pretend to be a different type of writer. So having been a journalist for 43 years, I sort of approached this with the techniques of a journalist, a documentarian, a detective, if you will, on a case. And what does a detective do? Well, you consult witnesses, you consult experts in different fields. And that's what I did. So I talked to post scholars, people who had devoted their lifetime to minutely studying various aspects of Poe's life and his writing. I spoke to many of the leading post scholars. This was also a way of acknowledging their great work on Poe. I talked to forensic people of all type, forensic anthropologists, forensic archaeologists, somebody who does autopsies all the time, you know, one of the leading forensic pathologists in the country, who is also a great Edgar Allan Poe fan, by the way, and was intimate with his life. They agreed to examine the evidence for me, reach their conclusions. I talked to medical historians. I talked to detectives. I talked to true crime writers. I even talked to, I brought the FBI in on the case. I talked to former FBI agent John Douglas, who is the pioneer in profiling at the FBI, who pretty much created the profiling unit at the FBI. It's sort of the loose model for the Scott Glenn character in Silence of the Lambs. John agreed to look at the evidence, reach some conclusions for me. And then I also went to the horror people, the people who did what we most acclaim Poe for, because they could get inside Poe's head and creative process in a way nobody else could. So I went to Wes Craven, and I went to Stephen King and Ray Bradbury, and these people, uh, some of them had passed by the time I had started working on the book. But I had done interviews with them in the past where I had discussed Edgar Allan Poe, like Vincent Price. My discussions with them about Poe were used in the book. All of these sort of gave me pieces of the puzzle. But again, I knew I was taking a chance. I knew I was somewhat leading with my chin by not only using the, the dual timeline, but also uh, doing interviews. If anybody reads the book and it's not their idea of what a biography should be, I will just fall back on what 
Stephen King once said when somebody objected to his writing basically horror stories. King said, if you object to the type of writing I do, all I can tell you is it is what I have. I can't pretend to be a different kind of writer. I can't write in a voice that is not my own or a style that is not my own. I thought it would add a life to the book, that it would add a presence to the book because these are very alive voices. These are people who are very present or who are looking at Poe and using their expertise to say, yes, but look at this part of his life very carefully. With that comes a lot of insight. I treated the diseases, the various possible causes for his death. If you're looking at this, like I say, as a detective, the people I interviewed were my witnesses and my experts. Then each possible cause of death were your suspects. It always came down to, can we dismiss this suspect? Can we get rid of this person and send this person home? What suspects continue to be our leading people of interest here? Who do we keep getting back in the room as our leading suspects? That's what I was interested in. I think I arrived at what I think was your primary person of interest, your primary suspect. And then I think there are accomplices. I think there are a couple of causes there. Alcohol is definitely a problem for Poe. It's not the problem most people think it was. I think most people think that Poe lived most of his adult life inside a bottle. And that's just not true. There were long periods of sobriety. Look, you don't live to be 40, right? enough to fill more than 17 volumes at work be of that high quality and be inebriated all the time. It's impossible. Were there long stretches of sobriety? Yes, of course. We have, there were periods like you know, 14 months where there's no record of Poe taking a drink. There's two problems. One is that the record is clear. Poe first drinks when he is a student very briefly at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. And from that moment on, all of the witnesses that ever saw Poe drink are pretty much unanimous in the fact that it took very little alcohol alcohol to get Poe very drunk. And Poe was not one to savor a drink and sip. He would get the first drink and throw it back. And he'd be immediately, it would seem like he'd been drinking for hours. And the recovery was awful. It wasn't just a morning hangover for Poe. It would, could take him days to recover from about a drinking where he'd be confined to bed recovering from this. Poe clearly is allergic to alcohol. So that's one problem. He's not drinking in the, the massive quantities that we think he is. But alcohol does have a devastating effect on him. Secondly, he tends to take a drink at the worst possible time when it's going to do his, him and his reputation the most harm. And people are going to remember, oh yeah, Poe is drinking. This is ammunition for after he dies for his enemies to say, oh yeah, Poe was, was always drunk. And that's not even close to true. But alcohol is a problem. It is a consistent problem throughout his adult life. Probably does take a toll on his system. So I look at alcohol as one of your main accomplices, probably what led to a deterioration in Poe's health. Do I think it's the primary cause? Do I think he died of alcoholism? No, I do not. But I do think it probably weakened his system. Another thing that probably weakened his system was poverty, the environmental causes that were around him. He's never living under the best circumstances. He's always living in poverty. Sometimes just regular meals are a problem. So that's another thing that's going to take a toll on him over a course of time. I certainly I would identify poverty and alcohol as prime accomplices in what certainly contributed to the death of Edgar Allan Poe. Although he passed away over 200 years ago, the interest today in Poe is just as strong as when he was alive. To what mark do you attribute the longevity of the public's fascination with him? I think there's a one-two punch there that have really conspired to keep Poe going as prominently as he had. One is curriculum. Poe has stayed in curriculum with a wonderful tenacity. You got Poe probably around the seventh grade. I did. Our children children get Poe, our grandchildren get Poe. He just keeps every year, every single year he gets reintroduced. And what a great age to get Edgar Allan Poe. We give Edgar Allan Poe to people at a point in their lives when A, reading is a chore. For most people in the seventh grade, oh no, another book we have to read or another story we have to read. Reading ain't fun for most. There's always one or two kids in the class that likes to read, but most kids are just, it's just a bloody chore. And then we give them Poe, who is, guess what? A bloody chore, but it's emphasized blood. We give them these wonderful stories that just explode the imagination. What a great age. All of a sudden, they've been reading all these things that don't say anything to them and just turn them off to reading. And then all of a sudden, we give them Poe. And what's Poe doing? Well, he's dismembering corpses. He's walling people up in catacombs. He's sticking them in torture chambers. And all of a sudden, it's like, this is reading? 
Really? This is fun. This is great. Kids love reading Poe in the seventh grade, and teachers love teaching Poe. And it's really kind of subversive. Can you imagine giving kids in the seventh grade the same type of stories by modern writers? The outcry at the next Board of Education meeting would be immense. People would be saying, you're giving them stories. He's what? He's dismembering corpses and burying them under the floorboards? You can't give kids that. We give them Poe doing that, and nobody lifts an eyebrow. Nobody complains. Nobody says anything anything about it. Then Poe stays in because you keep getting Poe. You get Poe through high school. And then if you take college literature courses, you're probably going to get Poe again. How many people had to memorize the first few stanzas of The Raven? How many people still can do it? I get always, every book signing I do, somebody goes, you know, I had to memorize the first five stanzas of The Raven. You know, I, I think I can still do it. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, and they're off to the races. So Poe gives you a connection and it's a multi-generational connection. A grandparent can talk about Poe with their grandchildren. They're going to meet, and they're going to meet on the level of the Telltale Heart, or the Cask of Amontillado, or the Raven. And that's one thing that, so Poe constantly gets reintroduced. That's not true of any other writer. That's not true of any other American European writer. It's not even true of Shakespeare. Nobody gets reintroduced and to that extent, that constantly, and with that much joy and enthusiasm. So there's that. The second thing is the pop culture. With curriculum, the pop culture has worked hand in hand to keep Poe an incredible present. And this starts in the 1930s. In the 1930s with the Universal Films, with Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi, The Raven, The Black Cat, The Murders in the Room Morgue, even though these movies had very little to do with the actual stories, they still made of Poe a presence in the pop culture. And this is rolling thunder. You get into the 60s and you've got the Roger Corman films with Vincent Price. Poe is on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. He's not only on the, the cover, he's got the top center position. He's name-checked in songs by John Lennon and Bob Dylan. Keep on going. The Rolling Thunder continues. Poe becomes the most merchandise writer in history. He becomes his stories are told and retold. Everything from South Park to SpongeBob SquarePants. Everybody's getting Poe on every level. Poe has such incredible street cred. He's cool to so many different groups and so many different artists have been fascinated by Poe. This one-two punch of the pop culture and academia working together has propelled Poe to a heights that no other writer enjoys. Should viewers of Paranormal Yacker want to buy Death and Life of Edgar Allan Poe and also learn about the other books you've authored, how can they do that? The book is widely available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's from St. Martin's Press, so it's from major publishers. Easily obtained, if not at a bookstore near you, certainly through any of the sites that are out there. I do have a website which will link you to any of these things. It's very cleverly called markdewitziak.com, so it's just myname.com, and that'll easily take you to the other books that I've written and any information about this 45 years writing career, which might work out someday. Mark Dowidziak, I thank you for being my guest on Paranormal Yakker. I very much enjoyed yakking with you. Well, as you can see, I like to yak. The title of your show certainly suits me. That's the one thing genetically I got. We all like to talk. <laughs> so yeah, and, and like I said, you know, any, any, anytime you want to revisit another subject, you know where to find me. Hi, everyone. This is Stan Mal on the Paranormal Yakker. I hope you enjoyed the interview you just watched. To be sure you're amongst the first to receive new interviews when they're released and to have access to previous ones, subscribe to my free YouTube channel. To do that, all you have to do is press the subscribe button on your screen.